This episode was sponsored by Patreon Mensch 1066, who chose this topic as part of his reward perk. Thank you very much for your support. Do you know this aircraft? It's the American Douglas TBD-1 Devastator and history has not been kind to this aeroplane. It often features as one of the worst aircraft of World War II in popular memory, ridiculed and maligned. Today I want to put that reputation to the test. Now, like last time when I did a similar video on the British Paul Bolton Define, this video leaps to the defense of the Devastator, not by being contrarian and insisting that you should like it, but by placing it into its proper historical context, going beyond popular memory and explaining the design and history, and also shedding some light on its overlooked achievements. And once we've been through the good, the bad, and indeed the ugly, it's up to you to decide on how to judge this aircraft. So what was the TBD Devastator and why was it, when it came out, a rather promising machine? Well, for this, we must go back into the early 1930s. The biplane reigning supreme within the armed forces around the world since the Great War of 1914 to 1918 had been the paragon of the sky for over 20 years. For single engine machines, the alternatives to be found were few. But as technology, aeronautics and the capabilities of the fleet changed, so too did it emerge that perhaps the Navy needed to boldly step forward and enter a new age of carrier strike aircraft. The scene was set for a usurper poised to topple the orthodoxy and supplant the biplane forever. The monoplane. True enough, in 1935, the United States Navy was composed out of a conventional biplane force, centered around scout bombers. The torpedo bomber was a novelty. This might seem strange, but before 1937, they were really a sideshow. In the five years before the TBD was introduced, the Navy only had one dedicated torpedo squadron flying TG-2s and one auxiliary squadron flying all-purpose Martin BMs. You've got to remember that naval strategy is essentially build strategy. Forecasting the right force competition many years in advance is key to developing an effective navy, since ships can't exactly be churned out like aircraft or tanks. This means that the 1920s and 1930s were a turbulent time for the Navy. If you've ever heard of Billy Mitchell, you know partly of what I'm alluding to. Suffice it to say that the Navy was divided in which force it wanted in the future. Should, for example, the focus be battleships or carriers? I can't go into the whole thing right now. Read this book if you're interested. It provides parts of the answer. It's of course linked in the description below, as with all my sources and all my videos. But the point that I'm making is that aviation became a lot more important. And as such, by 1933, as the budgets were started to be shifted, the Douglas Aircraft Company got wind via a contact in Washington that soon there would be a need for a new design, able to carry both bombs and a torpedo. Now this is important, so do remember it for later on. In any case, it took another year until SD-119-3 was released, but the information was correct. The Navy wanted a replacement for their Martin aircraft. Three competitors entered, Great Lakes, Hull and Douglas, but the competition was a farce. Hall came up with a float plane, the futuristic looking yet impractically and impractically named XPTBH and was sent packing. Great Lakes proposed a biplane, the XTBG-1, but that plane lost out against the XTBD in almost every regard. Thus Douglas won the competition without a fuss, but this was warranted beyond the failure in competition because when they presented the XTBD-1 in 1935, wow, it was a big surprise. It was something completely new. Indeed, the only feature that the Navy was used to was a crew layout, three men, a pilot, a bombardier who could act as a second pilot and a gunner. Beyond that, it was a novelty and foreign, as the observant could already see by the fact that it was a monoplane. The canopy was enclosed, the gear semi-retractable, the torpedo was partially set in the fuselage, the plane featured power-assisted folding wings halving the space requirements, and it was powered by an 800 horsepower Pratt & Whitney. The airplane hit a blistering speed of 200 miles an hour, that's 325 kilometers an hour, nearly double that of the older Martin torpedo bombers, and range 2 with a torpedo was 100 miles more. It really was something to get excited about. But of course, as with all prototypes, some things needed changing. Um, the engine needed a slight redesign, um, the oil cooler had to be moved as well, and the canopy was heightened. And there were, of course, a few other concerns, such as a rolling motion when the plane approached its stall point. By 1936, however, the issue Navy issued the first production order of 114 TBD-1s, and they were delivered the summer of the following year the tranquility of peacetime production. 
In any case, the final 1947 text concluded that the TBD-1 was found superior to the performance of any comparable horizontal or torpedo bomber in the Navy. And it had excellent flying characteristics and it had been entirely suitable for carrier operations or from an airfield. It is thus not a surprise that the TBD represents more than just the next step in carrier plane design. It was in fact the devastator that secured the standing of the torpedo strike aircraft in the Navy and that was no mean feat. By the mid 1930s more and more we can observe a shift from the conventional single engine biplane over to low wing monoplane designs around the world. You had the Dutch Fokker D21, the Japanese K27, the American P45 and of course the avant-garde Soviet I-16. The future was mono and it was indeed a TBD devastator that stood at the heart of this change and in many ways it was leading it. Adopted in 1947, the TBD was the first of many. It was the first production low-wing monoplane to see service on a US carrier. It was also the first all-metal single-engine strike aircraft of the US Navy. And it was the first to feature a, a closed cockpit and the first to have power-assisted folding wings. One might even say that for the time it was the most modern torpedo strike aircraft in the world. Yet across the Pacific, another comparable machine was start starting to roll out, the Japanese B-5N. Ominous foreshadowing. But before we hit the war, let's quickly have another look at the final production TBDs. As you know, one of the things I like to do is highlight certain characteristics about planes that you wouldn't usually find in other places. With the TBD-1, since it was so widely ignored, this isn't exactly hard, so I've made a list of a couple of neat features. First, the folding wings. For the US Navy, this became standard in the carrier aircraft during World War II, but the TBD started it all. The span of the aircraft was reduced from 50 feet to 25 feet 8 inches, which greatly assisted storage in hangar space and potentially elevator capacity. The following story will make it obvious how much of a novelty folding wings were on carrier at back then. During trials conducted on CV-2 USS Lexington in 1947, one of the TBD pilots right after landing decided to fold up his wings. The aircraft was instantly swarmed by the attentive firefighting crew who rushed in thinking that the plane was disintegrating. I guess they had a good chuckle about it later on. Second, the gear. You remember that the gear was retractable, which in the mid-1930s was still not a guarantee on planes of the TBD size. It was also not fully enclosed, which on first account seems like an omission. This was apparently a conscious decision. The idea was that if the aircraft were to belly land, the damage would be limited by the exposed gear taking the brunt of the strike, saving the actual fuselage. Now third, and this actually became uh, somewhat of an obsession of mine during my research, uh, just ask Justin from the Armour podcast, uh, the DBD-1 was part of the Navy's last drive to equip carrier aircraft with smoke laying devices. I researched this to the extent that I could, being physically removed from the archives in the US, but the idea was floating around since the mid-1920s. The aim was to give aircraft smoke laying devices to provide an express solution in masking fleet movements, or even to obscure a torpedo attack or to rob enemy planes visual of the friendly fleet. In that sense, it is very different to smoke laying in support of ground troops that we saw during World War II. The idea was tested during fleet maneuvers and the official pilot manual of the TPD does mention smoke canisters just like it does with the SBD Dauntless, yet as far as I can tell the idea was never used in World War II and the canisters were removed very early on. Now fourth, it being of course a naval plane, the aircraft was equipped with sizable flotation devices and these were also quite new and modern and provided buoyancy in case of a ditching so that the crew could evacuate in time. Fifth, the TBD was also tested as a float plane, yet this project, the TBD-1A, did not go past the prototype stage. And then sixth, the Navy did not experience any TBD losses to enemy fire until its very last Grand Fleet action at Midway. And seventh, the TBD had a fire suppression system but no self-sealing fuel tanks. And last but not least, the TBD was equipped with a Mark 15 a mod free bombsite. While nominally a torpedo bomber, the TBD was also used as a light level bomber, for example at Wake Island or during the successful Lei Salamaua raid in New Guinea in 1942. Check out our video on that. 
The site was located in such a location that the bombardier actually had to squeeze himself in the space below the pilot, laying prone, and from there he would release the bombs. Let's go into the weapons carried by the TBD then. It was armed with a single forward facing fixed machine gun, either a 30 cal or a 50 cal. You can spot the modification to a 50 cal by looking for a blister fairing on the starboard side. To aim this, the pilot would use the Mark III mod to telescopic gun sight. Defensively, another single 30 cal was mounted. When not in use, this was stored inside the fuselage via the use of folding doors. The exception here is VT-8 and perhaps VT-6, whom in preparation for the Battle of Midway, field modified this into a 12 30 cal. The turret had a good horizontal traverse, 180 degrees and 90 in the vertical. The seat rotated 360 degrees. The plane carried a maximum of 600 rounds for the turret. In any case, this weaponry was little more than for, well, self-defense. Moving on to the payload. For its horizontal bombing role, the official manual from 1947 is centered around two loadouts, either three 500-pound bombs or 12 100-pounders. It mentions a secondary loadout of two 500-pounds or one 1,000-pounder, but this is somewhat at the side. This gives us an idea of what in 37 the Navy considered as the most likely strike loadout. Yet from 178 strike missions flown, only 41 had been as a bomber, which is less than 25%, and it shows the focus the Navy had on the TBD as a torpedo bomber. So let's talk then again about the grand jewel of any, well, torpedo bomber, the actual torpedo. Never mind how good the aircraft is, it's the torpedo that makes the ultimate success. During testing in 37, the TBD was cleared after only making two drops of Mark A torpedoes. Since both the standard electrical release and the back of manual release had been tested, this would indicate that each release mechanism was tested once. Satisfied that it worked, the Navy moved on. For wartime operation, the 21-inch 2,000-pound Mark 13 torpedo was supposed to be used, and this of course means that, well, gloom and tragedy are on the horizon. But more on that later, just keep it in mind. And you might remember that early on in the video, I told you that Douglas had been informed in advance of some of the requirements of the new torpedo-capable strike aircraft. One of these things that they had been tipped off on was that the Navy wanted to have a torpedo placed at 10 degrees from the central line, half enclosed in the fuselage. And it had hoped that this arrangement would help the entry into water upon release, and also that the enclosure would reduce the drag. And when designing the TBD, Douglas of course kept this in mind. And this is why when you look at the Devastator, you see that torpedo slightly off angle set within the central fuselage. Now let's turn over to performance. Next to the torpedo, for which the TBD was not at fault, performance was the Achilles heel. But during pre-war years, it was positively outstanding. It outperformed previous American strike aircraft in terms of speed and range. It was modern, flew well, and was solidly constructed. On all accounts, it was a workhorse in the making. The production TBD did get a little performance boost by using a new Pratt & Whitney, but that was only accounting for an extra 50 horsepower. Following are the official performance characteristics from the 37 handbook. The engine was rated at 850 horsepower. Top speed at sea level was competitive for the time. And endurance at top speed and cruising were of course dependent on the loadout. However, both were good. And range, a crucial element for the Navy of course, was excellent for the 1930 standards. It should be noted that the TBD was actually never used at the maximum extent of its range during the war. You might also notice that in these hard stats, the Devastator does lose out against its direct competitor, the only slightly younger Japanese B5N. But again, that is a story for another time. But raw data is only one thing, so let's put one of the early aviators on the record. Well, after a few hours in the TBD, I was sure it was the best plane the Navy had at the time. It was faster than anything I'd flown in. Well, I gotta tell you, I was in love with the aircraft. Soon, field carrier landing practice took place, and this was followed by carrier qualifications, which was day and night. One of the early lessons that the LSO stressed was, don't ever let your aircraft get slow during final approach to the carrier, as the TBD didn't have as much power as needed to make a quick recovery. Now, returning to the ship with a torpedo or a maximum bomb load, it was wise to drop the ordnance, forgetting slow and into the groove, as they say, just wasn't acceptable. After observing an aircraft hit the ramp, well, this wise counsel certainly made a lasting impression on the pilot. 
Exciting piece of trivia, that man was William Esders and he started flying TBDs in 1948 and he was one of the few Devastator pilots who actually survived the battle of Midway. Another pilot noted, The TBD-1 was very stable and easy to handle. It broke from the deck at 70 knots and landed with full flaps at 60, even though the flaps didn't change its handling characteristics much. Now, it had a good, solid feel and was rock steady when coming aboard. The maneuvers we did with it were very limited. Basically, the TBD-1 was a straight and level airplane. It would perform moderately sharp turns, but I wouldn't roll or spin it. Its glide ratio was rather short, and although it was modern in 37, it was obsolete by 1942, and, well, we knew it. That was Lieutenant Robert Laub from the Enterprise. He too would survive the war and make it to Rear Admiral. It should also be noted that, especially because the TBD was so new and quite complex, that getting used to this new aircraft wasn't easy. Pilots did mention that the new long checklist was overwhelming and that the plethora of hydraulic and electrical system did take some getting used to. Trading losses were relatively low at only eight, including a peculiar incident where the wings hadn't been locked down properly before takeoff. But until 1941, the, and although the flying qualities were rather good, a further 30 DBDs would be lost in accident. A fairly high number, but perhaps understandable, considering that for most pilots, it was unlike anything they had flown before. The full production run of TBDs did not exceed 130 airframes, delivered between August 37 and October 39. Surprising perhaps though due to the limited number, although actually for the time it is one of the larger orders, and the long time it took for them to be built. Well, you know, that's peacetime for you, but it's also the case that bombing still retained doctrinal supremacy over torpedo attacks in the Navy. And this was only changing slowly. I mean, a <laughs> Ranger was built without a dedicated torpedo storage. Um, but remember that I did mention that torpedo bombers was, a, you know, that novelty and it was not a staple in the Navy. Sure enough, with the TBD, the torpedo bomber did actually get off the bench and secured an official spot in the Navy's first team lineup. But during peacetime, the training focus remained on bombs rather than torpedoes. The production run did provide enough aircraft for the carriers Lexington, Saratoga, Enterprise, Yorktown and Hornet. Wasp and Ranger also eventually received a small complement. After the allocation, another 70 or so TBDs were left over, some making it to the United Kingdom, stationed, for example, next to Scapa Flow. The Devastator became the vanguard of a modernizing US Navy, kickstarting the drive together with the Vought SB2U. That would see eventually the Navy taking on aircraft like the Brewster F2A, the Grumham F4F, or indeed the SBD Dauntless. So far it would seem that things don't look too badly for the TBD-1, but then the US was plunged into World War II with Pearl Harbor and the Devastator was already four years old. By my estimation, the TBD's shortcoming is a mixture of three things, performance, torpedo and context. Let's look at these in turn. The TBD's misfortune was that it came out a smidge too early. Designed in 1935 and rolling off the production lines in 37, it came out just as massive jumps were realized across the world in aircraft design and performance. For example, the SPD Dauntless is a year younger, but we can already see that grand leap forward with that aircraft. And the TBD was instead stuck in that awkward space, modern enough to be the herald of a new age, but too old to be competitive in modern war. And returning to Robert Laub from the Enterprise, here's what he had to say on the subject of the TBD's performance. Now the XTBD may have flown at 200 knots, but uh, I never flew an operational type that did better than 150. And that was downhill, with all the right conditions. You were doing well to make 120 knots in the TBD with a torpedo, and since protruding fish didn't create a great deal of drag, 130 knots clean was normal. The TBD took all day to climb to altitude, and if you went to 15,000 feet in it, you just about used up all your fuel. 12,000 feet was maximum bombing altitude, and because we never went higher, we carried no oxygen, although the aircraft was equipped to handle it. 
Now I can't pinpoint the exact discrepancy between the handbook stats from 1947 and uh, here they are as a reminder again and Laub's works. But I would assume that next to potentially misremembering something, that quote is from 1970, that the strain of four years of service on airframes, some infield modifications and the toils of war caused an explainable fall off in performance over the years. And next to that, of course, the clinical stats you sometimes find in handbooks must be taken with a little grain of salt. Turning to the torpedo, I don't think it is an overstatement to say that the Devastator's record would have been a lot, lot better had it not been for the Mark 13 torpedo, or rather the 40 Mark 13. This fish's history is closely intertwined with that of the TBDs to the point where we can't really separate the two. Uh, early on, this torpedo was little more than a 2,000 pound disaster. With the Mark 24 director's side, a torpedo could be sent with relatively certainty towards its intended target, yet the Mark 13 it was an anarchic bugger with a volatile mind. Uh, crews often complained that the 21 incher would break up on impact, fail to engage or veer off into the never. And it's really hard to judge the exact impact that the failure rate had on the TBD's record. But one thing is sure, any shortcomings were made worse by the lack of success due to the faulty torpedoes. Now, truth be told, mechanical failures were part of the business, but the Mark 13 crossed the line. At Tulangi, one hit out of 22 drops, that's 5%, produced, well, a rather lackluster result. And at Le Salamaua, only 3 out of 13 torpedoes, that's 20%, hit their mark. Both raids were relatively easy, and at Le Salamaua, there was very limited enemy opposition, and the conditions were perfect. For that raid, the Navy had anticipated 9 hits or 70%. Yes, that is an optimistic number, but 20% are lightly defended and near stationed targets? That's suboptimal. For comparison, at Pearl Harbor, the Japanese had a success rate of about 50% with their torpedoes. Not 90% that's sometimes claimed, just read Al Sims' book. Uh, but then that's them, after the first surprise was overcome, facing a whole battle fleet with every single Joe firing anything from a 3-inch gun, Olicon, 50 cal down to their Springfields and 1911s. Friedman actually mentions that the Americans, for their part, after fixing the Mark 13 way past the TBD's retirement, got an, an estimated overall hit ratio of 40% for the war, although there might be a couple of false positives in that number. Following is an approximate list of TBD missions with torpedoes. Remember that reports sometimes vary, so there could be a little bit of a variance in the numbers, but this should give you a good idea of the difficulties the aviators faced with their torpedo, even if it is not a complete list. In 1942, between Kuala Lane and Midway, around 130 sorties were flown. Since not every plane back, it's hard to say how many drops were made exactly, especially at Midway, but I'll use Tillman's estimate of 95. Out of these only 12 hits were secured, and actually seven of those were on the Japanese carrier Shoho during the Coral Sea. This would imply an overall success rate of the Mark 13 torpedo with the TPBD of 12%. Since around 50 drops were made against Japanese carriers with only hits on Shoho made, I wonder whether a working torpedo might not have changed the memory of this aircraft. Let's turn to the final category, the context. Part of this, of course, is already given with performance and the torpedo. The DBD was beyond its prime thanks to rapid accelerations in technology and aircraft design, and it had a torpedo that didn't work. But we have to explore the context for torpedo bombing in World War II a little bit more, and once we've done that, I am going to have a look at two battles, the Battle of the Coral Sea and Midway, to explain what caused the Devastators to both succeed and fail. What should be mentioned is that torpedo bombing is really an inherently risky business as, well, if they hadn't anticipated it before, nearly all major powers found out during World War II. The fact of coming in low puts you at the mercy of intervening fighter aircraft, and you only really stand a chance against those if you have attentive escorts. And you have to face the combined AA firepower of every single ship in the target fleet. And beyond that, on your final stretch, you have very little chance to do any kind of ducking and weaving because, after all, you need to pop that fish at the correct heading, altitude and speed, which makes you a very easy target. A torpedo bomber is only ever as good as its torpedo and it is shackled by the drop parameters. For the Mark 13, that meant drops needed to be made at speeds of roughly 110 knots and not higher than 50 feet. Of course, yes, eventually this was improved, but not in time for the TBD. 
This is very much different to dive bombers that drop simple bombs after coming in from high above, thereby exposed to less intense AA fire before their final dive, and then they come in at angles that make them hard to hit, even on concentrated defensive firepower. As well as that, after the dive, even with the dive breaks employed, the dive bombers have the advantage of speed once they have dropped their payload, whereas torpedo bombers essentially remain slow and slow, desperately trying to find the nearest exit route in a sea full of enemy ships. It doesn't matter if you are in the Mediterranean or the Pacific, once going against a large enough fleet with enough guns or even fighter cover, torpedo attacks suffered horribly. Just look at, for example, the Italian SM-79s or the Japanese G4Ms. But there are arg arguments to be made for such attacks. Torpedoes can be extremely effective against solitary or lightly defended targets, but even to capital ships. But against a fleet, they have to be used in conjunction with a coordinated dive bombing attack to be effective. But even then, the incoming aircraft have very little cover, are vulnerable, and don't stand much chance against determined opposition. And if there's one person that is determined, it is a sailor manning an AA gun. Considering this, it's no real surprise that after a short honeymoon, the US Navy started to re-evaluate torpedo bombing and shifting their tactics to at least alleviate the inherent vulnerability of this type of aircraft. This included tighter coordination with escort aircraft, but also by shifting these planes into other roles, such as, for example, bombing, close air support, search and rescue, as well as anti-submarine warfare. So when assessing the Devastator beyond the technical issues with the torpedoes, beyond the lack of escorts and its anemic performance in 1942, we do have to ask ourselves whether part of the problem was not the concept and execution of torpedo attacks. The Battle of the Coral Sea is perhaps the Devastator's claim to fame, because in many ways it showed what the aircraft could do in the right conditions. At the Coral Sea, the Americans sent out one flight of TPD-1s from both the Lexington and the Yorktown. With Lexington going out first, they attacked the Japanese carrier Shoho, already smoking after being hit by Dauntlesses. For once, the Mark 13 played along and five hits were scored, effectively dooming the carrier. What made this attack special is that the Devastators could actually anvil the Shoho coming in from two sides and setting a torpedo spread that Shoho had no chance of escaping. A later attack by Yorktown fielded another two hits and that was Shoho done for for the war. While Yorktown's TBDs were involved in a scrap after the attack, just like Lexington's, none were lost. Together, the squadrons had achieved a hit ratio of 37%. This attack goes to show that what could be done under perfect conditions. The defensive AA fire had been weakened and split by the SBDs, the Japanese fleet held no tight formation, and perhaps crucially, its fighters were busy chasing the American dive bombers and duking it out with the escort fighters. For the TBD, it was like striding through a saloon brawl, only having to avoid a stray flying glass before ordering their choice beverage at the bar. This is why context matters, because looking at this result of this battle alone, you might think that, heck, you know, torpedo bombing worked just fine. I don't see what the fuss is all about. In reality, however, the TBD worked at the Coral Sea because the Coral Sea worked for the TBD. Which means, of course, that we have to turn to, well, <laughs> the elephant in the room, the Battle of Midway. And the final nail in the coven of the TBD-1 Devastator. Just like at the Coral Sea, looking only at Midway might leave you with a wrong impression, because many things went wrong at Midway that should not have gone wrong. Yet the TBD paid a price, while at the same time making a sacrifice that gave its slow but deadly cousin, the SPD Dauntless, the break to score a couple of home runs. The overall story of Midway is wildly no. My buddy MHV made a video on that battle, but let's summarize the Devastator's involvement. Unlike the Coral Sea, the TBDs did not come in without me causing a fuss. In fact, they were a magnet for trouble in this battle. A6M0s pounced them way before they ever reached their drop positions. The escorting Wildcats couldn't communicate with their groups and also became embroiled in trouble of their own. So the TBDs were left to fend off experienced and dedicated Japanese fighter pilots by themselves. As well as that, the carriers maneuvered to give the TBDs an unfavorable run-up and the dive bombers could not arrive at the same time, 
unlike at the Coral Sea. VT-8, the first attacking squadron going for Shoryu, was massacred. The upgunning of the turret and the installation of an armored seed made very little difference. Not a single plane out of 15 made it home, and only one drop had been made. VT-6 attack against Kaga was similarly tragic. 40 planes went out, 6 drops were made, 4 came back, and that's for 0 hits. One crew was fished out of the sea two weeks later. Following the same pattern was VT's freeze attack against Hiryu. As the TBDs went in, where they were hounded by Zeros and Flak, desperately trying to get into a drop position, but the carrier just kept on escaping. Five drops were made with no hits. Esters actually tried to lead the survivors out of the crucible, and eventually two crews, including Esters, were finally rescued after they had to ditch. Uh, here's actually him recounting that story. Four zeros had chased me. I want to say 20, maybe 25 miles. The last one, he flew alongside about 10 feet off my wingtip. Now the pilot, he raised his right hand, you see. Apparently executing a half salute. What he intended to mean, I may never know. Possibly good show, well done, or perhaps let me get some more ammunition. Now, whatever it was, he joined the other three and headed for their fleet. Now, soon I was joined by machinist Harry Coral with his gunner, Lloyd Childers, and we headed for the Yorktown. Unfortunately, we were both forced to ditch and were later rescued. While the TBD's attacks resulted in the Japanese cap being unable to attack the Dauntlesses that secured the eventual US victory at Midway, 37 out of 41 Devastators failed to return. The existing squadrons had been decimated beyond recognition, and VT-8 was gone. But the body count was worse than a number, as many of the crews lost had been amongst the most experienced Navy flyers, with three to four years under their belt. That knowledge, skill and experience beyond the human life had been lost. And saving grace was perhaps that these attacks were flown with only two crew members instead of the usual three. Now the DBD's lack of performance and the outdated design is often considered at fault. And yes, absolutely, it didn't help. But one thing that isn't considered when judging the Devastator for its performance at Midway is that land-based TBF the Avengers also launched an attack. By the way, we actually do have a full Inside Out episode on the TBF, check it out. But the Avenger was a TBD's replacement and a vastly superior plane, but out of six cent, only one made it back. The fact that the TBF was a superior aircraft, well, it didn't matter at Midway. It suffered the same problems, you know, a lack of air cover, a slow run-up, an unpredictable torpedo, um, no coordination with Wildcats or SPDs, and poor tactical positioning. And that was, well, the crux of the matter. At Coral Sea, everything that could go right went right. At Midway, the opposite was true for the torpedo squadrons. Had the escorts managed to stay with the TBDs, maybe things would have been different. Maybe. Uh, or perhaps if the TBDs had been able to have a more favorable approach against the carriers instead of having you know, to chase them. Uh, that could have changed things. Perhaps. In the end, it's all philosophical. With the Avenger, at least a more powerful machine now appeared. But the Navy still had to find its happy place when it came to dropping torpedoes. The performance gap had been overcome. But next to that tight coordination with escort fighters and dive bombers, as well as better executed strikes, tactical positioning, and a more agreeable torpedo had to be developed. The TBD, however, well, it would see none of that. And after all of that, it is up to you to make up your mind. What is your opinion on the TBD-1 Devastator? Do you look at it differently now or do you want to add something? Let me know in the comments below. Please do support the channel on Patreon, which is really important since YouTube still doesn't exactly like my videos. A big thank you to all of those that already do. It is really very much appreciated. And don't forget to share this video. It does help so much. Thank you very much to Justin for his help with some of the sources. As usual, my sources are linked below. And also a big thank you to SideStory for providing all the voice lines that were not my own. And as always, have a great day, good hunting, and see you in the sky.